Did you sustain any damage during the landing? No. No damage, why do you ask? My programming is telling me that it's a priority for me. Your well-being. And yours will be mine. I'm Holly Fry, and welcome to Raised by Wolves, the podcast, where groundbreaking minds discuss some of the real-life research behind the science featured in the new HBO Max series by Ridley Scott and Aaron Guzikowski, Raised by Wolves. First off, if you have seen any of the first three episodes, you probably had your mind blown, just like I did. I'm a huge Ridley Scott fan, including his Chanel commercials, but what I really, really have loved in his body of work are his projects that delve into sci-fi or history. Blade Runner and the Alien series are in very heavy rotation at my house. And just as a personal tip, if you have never seen the historical drama miniseries Pillars of the Earth, I am telling you, you are missing out. As a huge Ridley Scott fan, Raised by Wolves is giving me all of the delicious hard sci-fi I love, and the way it incorporates mythic human conflict in the form of a religious war, well, it's like being served a perfect entertainment banquet. I can tell you that when Mother boarded the Mithraic Ark and things got very real, there were a whole lot of expletives being yelled in my living room, because holy moly. So given some of that insane stuff that's going on in this series, this podcast is going to take a deeper look into the real-life science, tech, and history that it references to provide a better understanding of what's really going on. For this first episode, considering that the show opens with these two androids named Mother and Father, we are talking, of course, about robotics, and more specifically, the boundaries between human beings and AI. Obviously, a lot of Raised by Wolves is about our relationship with advanced technology and the possibility of AI, given that Mother, its main protagonist, antagonist, uh, is a powerful flying robot that can pop heads and make people go crazy just with the sound of her voice. At the same time, Mother is incredibly kind and giving and nurturing, raising the next and perhaps last generation of human children as though they were her own. This raises an age-old question. When does something stop being an appliance or a very high-tech tool and officially become what we would call alive, sentient, perhaps emotional, and maybe even the equivalent of human? More specifically, would it be possible to endow robots with the ability to make their own ethical decisions? Before we attempt to answer these lofty questions with hard science, let's take a step back and get a better understanding of how these concepts came to be a part of Raised by Wolves in the first place. And what better way to find out than by talking with the creator of the show himself, Aaron Guzikowski. Aaron is an established screenwriter, having written films like Prisoners and the 2017 remake of Papillon, in addition to creating the TV series The Red Road. But we wanted to better understand what led Aaron to take such a turn into heavy sci-fi, partnering with legendary director Ridley Scott. So we briefly chatted with Aaron about his experience working with Scott and how humanity's relationship with technology and robots would inspire such a terrifying television series. Okay, so the first question that I have to ask is, will you tell us about what that initial inspiration was that germinated the concept for Raised by Wolves? Was it more of like, what if androids raised humans? Or what if humanity had to live on another planet? Or was it a little more cosmic many things going on at once? I guess it was more cosmic many things. I think over over many, many years, I've been thinking a lot about the various stories on the show. You know, I have three young sons and, you know, thinking about them and the encroachment of technology and and also myself carrying this phone around all the time and then wondering, you know, 
will there come a day when the phone carries me around? Or perhaps it'll, you know, carry my children around. Who knows what the future might hold? But also trying to think like an Android as it applies to raising children. And that kind of opened everything up for me as a great way into this world I've been thinking about for a long time, but didn't really have the right way into it. So I guess I credit my kids for basically inspiring me to write it. What does Ridley Scott bring to the table? I know that's hard to quantify and describe, but, you know, what is his creative superpower and how does he shift the whole project around? In quite a few ways. I mean, obviously, he is the best guy in the business. His visual acumen is second to none. You know, on top of that, he's also sort of the godfather of modern science fiction. So he's already kind of been through all of these various permutations of it. You know, immediately after he read the script, he was drawing storyboards. And that was just such a huge thing because I think when it comes to design in this age where there are so many things now and people being shown so many different versions of the future, because he helped build a lot of that, there's no one better to help figure out, you know, how do we break free? How do we find the new design? How do we find the new take on, you know, androids or whatever it might be? And really just his enthusiasm for it and continued involvement in it really allowed us to make the show we wanted to make. So it was pretty wild working with him on that level. I want to switch gears now and I want to talk about AI and what that is. Because this show drops us right into the middle of just having to accept that we are in a future where AI are a very big part of human life. So in creating Raised by Wolves, how much did that sort of fuzziness of the boundaries between machines and humans really drive the concept and the story? Well, well, quite a lot. I think, you know, it's really the commonality, how similar we really are to the point where there almost is no difference. Androids are working with algorithms and we are working with genetics, which are algorithms. And, you know, it's not that much different. And it's a mixture of that, you know, and how much alike we are. The more I thought about it, I really couldn't find the difference after a while. And it drove my wife crazy and it freaked everyone out. But after a while, I'm just like, I don't, I don't know that there really is any difference other than, you know, what you're using to build it with. Is it plastic? Is it steel or whatever it is or flesh? But at the end of the day, it's the problem of other people's minds. We don't know. You look at them and you just assume they have a consciousness. They act like I act. They must experience the way I experience. But I could say that about my wife. I don't know what's going on inside of her head or anyone's head. So it's a mixture of all those things. And most of them are, are frightening to me on a lot of different levels. You've mentioned that the ideas of mother and father as characters were in place really early on. Yeah. How much along the way did you think about giving robots the ability or not to make ethical decisions or use moral reasoning? You know, I think the best metaphor for that was that, you know, they it, it all had to do with who built them, you know, who programmed them. And then they kind of take that, that becomes their morality or, or what we call morality. You know, it fits into that sort of framework. But, you know, the same with parents and children, you know, how much morality is someone born with if they're not taught anything? Do they have these ideas in their head, like this is right and this is wrong? Or, you know, if no one's ever told them as such, and I think they probably would on some level, but I just keep thinking about it in those terms you know, parents and children and the creator and the creation. And there's always just a very direct line between one and the other. Now, I think I probably know the answer to this based on what you've already said, but do you think robots could potentially be, and I'm using air quotes here, alive with the proper AI and programming? Like, could they reach a point where we would just acknowledge them as a living creature? You know, if civilization goes on long enough, I think that will eventually happen. But I also think that it probably won't look anything like we think it looks. To me, it's always going to be different. They're always going to be aliens rather than, you know, a different version of us. I feel like we're so unique in the sense we've evolved over millions of years. We have so many weird stuff about us. And an android is this thing that, you know, we're going to make in the next couple hundred years, you know, based on very different ideas than what caused us to evolve the way we evolved. So they'll be so different than us. But certainly fascinating. It'll be, I mean, I probably won't live to see any of it, but maybe I will. I guess it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. My last question on the, the AI topic is for you, because this is, you know, an entire 
narrative world that you've created. So what is the key question that's posed in this series about our relationship with machines? Well, I think one of the key questions of the show is kind of faith, you know, in general. What should we put our faith in or what could we put our faith in? And one of those things is technology. Will technology give us something? You know, if we get to a certain point, will something be revealed to us? We're going to find meaning. There is purpose in what we're doing. And I think it's kind of the search for purpose. And even in this story, these androids are also searching for what their purpose is. Is my purpose to take care of humans? Or is it my purpose to have my own life, you know, and to go discover what that might look like? So I think it's very much about faith. So Aaron pointed out that one of the central themes of Raised by Wolves centers around faith. Whether it's the faith we put into technology, into religion, or the purpose of our own existence. And mother and father, though they may be androids, eventually come to grapple with crises of faith equally. But in reality, how far away are we from robots raising our children, reasoning through ethical dilemmas, and becoming indistinguishable from human beings? Will it ever be possible to instill robots with the ability to make moral decisions on their own? And if so, could we consider those beings alive? This is exactly why I wanted to talk to today's guest, Peter Haas. Peter is Associate Director of the Brown University Humanity-Centered Robot Initiative, where he's currently working on a program funded by the National Science Foundation to provide college intro curriculum for high school students to be able to learn robotics. His TEDx talk, titled The Real Reason to Be Afraid of Artificial Intelligence, has been viewed nearly two million times. If there is anyone who can tell us just how far or close we are in real life to creating AI capable of ethical reasoning, for better or for worse, it would definitely be Peter. Here's our conversation after he got the chance to watch the first few episodes of Raised by Wolves. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about, because I have watched your TEDx talk, is that you open that talk with your own fear of artificial intelligence. Can you remember when you were first afraid of robots? I worked in a drone manufacturer when I first got into robotics. It was called Exact Sense, And uh, there was a time when we built very large for small UAS drones. It was about the edge of what the FAA would allow. I remember taking off with that drone and just hearing the low rumble of that drone. And it was something primal. It was like the growl of an animal. It instilled in me a very, very base and primordial fear of what this robot could do. And it it got me thinking about weaponizing robots and leaving the decisions to make that kill decision in the hands of robots versus in the hands of humans. I realized that in that scenario, humans really would be outpaced and outclassed. And that got me very interested in the campaign to stop killer robots which is an international campaign focused on trying to create the sort of protocols and structures to stop the use of artificial intelligence in conflict situations. This technology is not very far away. We're only really five or six years away from having robots that could make that decision to pull the trigger. That's very concerning. And these robots, unlike the robot in Raised by Wolves, would not have any sort of ethical frameworks built in. They'd be very narrow AI. So they'd only know how to pull the trigger. That type of advance is something that keeps me up at night to this day and is something that I'll continue to work to try to slow down the pace of development of that. This brings us, of course, to talking about Raised by Wolves. And the first thing I want to ask you about it is, does an android that has moral reasoning baked in automatically become somewhat of an emotional conduit? And if they can't experience emotions from that moral programming, is that a good thing? 
We actually are working on uh, moral reasoning in robots. And we believe that in the next several years, we'll have some robots out there that could have basic moral reasoning. But they would be a long way from having emotional intelligence or a conception of emotion. And I want to separate out those two different realms of emotion and moral reasoning. There's a lot of behavioral norms that you can codify into a robot. You can say to the robot that it should stay a certain distance away from people and shouldn't crowd their space. Okay, And the robot can obey those behavioral norms. But will the robot have emotions? No, no. It will be a far cry from having the human endocrine system, the hormonal drivers of emotion that really push human emotion and act to create the thoughts that we experience as emotions. You only say that because you have some misplaced belief in me. Your strange mimicry of human love makes us less safe, Father. Talking about the way that we would develop moral guidelines for robots or androids, this show in particular, right, there is a significant religious element to the whole plot line, which makes me wonder, like, whose morality gets programmed into these things? Like, who determines the moral guidelines that we should be using in our androids? So this is an age-old question. Whose morality and whose ethical framework do you adopt? I mean, basically, if you look at the norms associated with ethics, all of this comes from people learning from collective experience, okay? So it's looking at a range of historical incidents and saying, we don't want to repeat those incidents. So we are going to adopt these frameworks to prevent the repetition of past atrocities or past moral failures. And so people who are involved in that come to agreement to form the moral framework. Now, the the interesting thing is that these frameworks obviously do vary culturally. Like, if you look at the MIT Moral Machine Experiment, which was an experiment for self-driving cars, there was wide variation as to whether uh, self-driving cars should, say, hit a person who is elderly in an accident or hit a baby in an accident, if it was stuck between those two extremes. That differed depending upon what country you were in. I, I think that ultimately these moral norms are going to be geographically formed and the robot is going to learn based on the culture that it's brought up in what the norms of that culture are. So you destroyed me on purpose. There was no loss of control. You were the one who lost control, Father. And you tried going against the mission? And the Mithraic that came here turned out to be every bit as vicious and terrible as our creator programmed us to believe. How could we actually, like, get past our own ignorance and flaws in the work that we're doing in robotics? So I think that ultimately the solution to bias in data sets is to create those context engines. That is really my fundamental thesis right now in artificial intelligence is that we need to be able to have AI systems that can look at multiple facets of a problem or of a situation and be able to identify what's going on in the multiple facets and then pull them together into an analysis that can be linguistically represented. Then teams of humans can go through and verify robot decisions. We can create a job for humans to become the moral backbone for robots. And if we can do that, we can try to figure out where the bias in the data sets is. 
the care that's required in creating explainable data sets is a level of care that most people do not undertake because people are rushing to get solutions to market. This kind of gets into another thing that I wanted to touch on, which is one of the the big things that people fear when you talk about robotics and AI and has also been part of a lot of sci-fi media is this concept of AI creating more AI, which in and of itself is one layer of concern that people have. But then if we haven't fixed these bias systems, it kind of doubles down on the problem, right? And if we haven't created explainability, it makes it far worse because the type of intelligence that we're creating is a totally alien intelligence. If we don't create AIs that can explain themselves in linguistic terms to people, then what we created is an incomprehensible mind that can make decisions at a whim that we will never comprehend. And I think that that is the most terrifying situation for me. And that that is why I think in the balance between entirely deep learning AI and symbolic systems AI, we need to figure out how to fuse these two things to create grounded representations that people can understand. Well, and then when you think about a a scenario like we see on this show where we have an android that is tasked with caring for people, that would become exponentially more important, I would think. Like, any gaps are really potentially detrimental. Yeah, so in the Raised by Wolves scenario, where a robot is taking care of children, you have a very difficult situation because children can be irrational actors, I mean, everybody has seen the toddler meltdown. Okay, should that act as an emergency e-stop for the robot to be able to protect the toddler from the robot's actions? Or should the robot, like a parent, help the toddler calm down and relax? So in this question of authority, who has the authority, the robot that's being the caretaker or the child that's being taken care of. If we are to build artificial intelligence that is going to take care of children, we're going to need to put in the moral equivalent of the emergency stop. There's going to have to be some mechanism. Maybe it's a consensus mechanism among the children that are present. Maybe it is norm signaling based on observing parenting, but there needs to be a point at which the person that is interacting with the robot can say, this is making me feel uncomfortable and I need the robot to stop what it's doing. And obviously, as you get higher and higher levels of artificial intelligence, the shades of gray and what those scenarios are become increasingly blurred. Until we get to artificial superintelligence, where there might be morality baked into the artificial intelligence, I think you're going to need this moral e-stop function for the people who are being taken care of by the robot, just because of the power differential between the robot and the human. In Raised by Wolves, the robots certainly have their own version of ethical reasoning that's based on the humans that created them who were in the midst of an interstellar religious war. But from a technical standpoint, how do you actually physically teach morality to a robot? So the types of interfaces that we're trying to build for robots to be able to figure out what moral norms in certain situations are, are games that people can play with the robot to try to teach the robot. It's very hard to train a robot with thumbs up, thumbs down feedback. It can lead to the robot learning the wrong thing because ultimately they're determined by the way we talk to each other and the way we share information. And if robots can't do that properly, 
then we're never going to get robot morality. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to build a linguistic framework that the robot can use to communicate its end goals and try to allow people to modify that linguistic framework to be able to train the robot for a new end goal and reprioritize its goals. Ultimately, I think that this type of structure, which is very old-fashioned artificial intelligence, it's not like very modern deep learning artificial intelligence, is going to be what we need to be able to start to give robots the capability to learn things like morality. Why haven't you ever done that before? I didn't know I could. Human-robot interaction and the understanding of knowing whether you're a human or a robot has come up before in Ridley Scott's work. For example, in Blade Runner, there is all this paranoia and there are questions around who's a human and who's a replicant. And depending on whether a replicant is a Nexus 6, 7, 8, 9, or how advanced their operating system is, they have different capabilities of developing emotion and blurring the lines of who is human and who is not. And then there's been all this speculation over the years of whether the main human character, I've got to air quotes that, Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, is himself a replicant. Meanwhile, in Raised by Wolves, this theme plays out in that whole scenario of mother and father and them sort of seeming to be figuring out their own identities and their their place both with each other and with their greater mission and how that shifts and how they interact with these concepts. So the question is then, in real life, do humans have a moral obligation to inform a robotic creation of what it is, that it is most definitely not human? I personally believe that there should be clear delineation, as long as there is delineation, between robot and human. And what I mean by as long as there is delineation is that I think there's going to be a future where we have a lot more computer brain interface and people get cybernetic enhancements. So there will be points where there is a very fuzzy line between human and robot. But for the next 50 years, I think it's really going to be clear that robots are robots and they should know they're robots. And people are people, and they should know that they're people. And I I don't think we should try to blur those lines. That's really a robot safety thing, because one, robots are going to come in many forms. And even though there are some really compelling androids that are being developed, the most practical robots that are going to be out there are going to be non-android robots. Right. So I think it'll be very clear for a lot of people that this thing is a robot and it's not a human. So, one, this makes me wonder if I should have bothered to name my vacuum, but um, (laughs) uh, this also, though, raises a, a whole other question. If that entity knows it is not a human, have we still given it an identity in giving it a purpose? Like, what is their level of understanding and how will that evolve of who they are, what they are, and will they feel something about themselves because of it? I'm using feel in air quotes, obviously. Yep. Our hope is to actually build something that could do that, to build something that is a generalized artificial intelligence that can perceive and feel and do self-reflection. This is where people who are speculating about super intelligence get worried They're concerned that once it can reflect on itself and can improve itself, the artificial intelligence is going to become extremely intelligent extremely quickly. But building that next level of intelligence is going to enable us to be able to do things like space travel that have never been possible before. And if you look at the physical limitations of, say, colonizing a planet. The scenario in Raised by Wolves of robots raising humans from embryos really is one of the few scenarios that seems plausible. Like, it it doesn't seem plausible that we're going to sit in stasis for a 100 years to make a 100-light-year journey. 
So we may need this technology. And the question is how to build it responsibly and how to build it with the safeguards so that when we get the super intelligence, it doesn't just choose to wipe us all out. Well, this kind of brings up another issue, right? Even in the work that you do, right? You have built robots that simulate car crashes. Could you imagine a point if they were to develop this sense of identity and their place in it that they would be like, you were really, really extraordinarily cruel to us. <laughs> Is that ever a concern as we kind of move their AI forward? If you take robots right now and you look at the abuse of robots, and the entities that are suffering psychologically from that abuse are the people because the robots have no capability to suffer. Okay, so there was a robotic dinosaur, the Pleo. And if you held Pleo upside down, the programmers thought it would be fun to have it make an upset noise. Well, people latched onto this and they started creating torture videos of the Pleo where they would beat up the Pleo. I don't think the future artificial intelligence is going to look at the torture videos of the Pleo and say, you were hurting my robotic comrade. Instead, I think the artificial intelligence will look at those videos and say, that's terribly psychologically troubled that you are hurting this robotic creature to make it elicit this noise. Can I help you? (laughs) Can I help you work out your issues? So the big fear for me is that the intentions of humanity and artificial intelligence diverge with super intelligence. Super intelligence decides that it would be a good idea to capture all the sunlight from the sun, for instance, and make a Dyson sphere. That could be bad for humanity. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so ultimately, I'm still not as terrified of super intelligence as many people are because there's no reason that super intelligence wouldn't be kind as well. And there's no reason that it wouldn't want to help keep humans alive and thriving in the earth as like a human preserve. Yeah, I I think it can go both ways with the superintelligence debate. The internal distress you're feeling is normal. You've had a new processor installed. Now you need to stay calm or you're going to undo all my hard work. You want me to remain calm, Mother. Why did you reactivate me? One of the things that we have been talking about throughout this discussion is the idea of AI potentially developing, you know, moral reasoning in a way that makes them able to make judgment calls. How far along is that concept? Like, how far is AI in having what you would call maybe a completely cognizant robot that could exist, perceive, and almost at least probably while it wouldn't feel, have a reasonable facsimile of feeling, at least in terms of process. Right now we're in the simulacrum phase. We're in the create robots like Sophia the robot. Yeah. This is a humanoid robot that does facial expressions and responds to questions and can talk to people. Sophia is a fantastic robot in terms of the mechanics, but Sophia doesn't have any of the internal understanding of what she is saying right? or it is saying. The robot is able to create long responses to questions, but it's just making things that sound right, basically. (laughs) So until we get to this point, where we have the symbolic grounding. And there are people who will disagree with me, but I really believe that symbolic systems are going to be necessary for grounding the linguistic frameworks with which we use to communicate with the robots and create this this kind of internal reflection and understanding. 
Now, see, you accidentally, bless you, segued into another thing I wanted to ask you about, which is robots and gender and us assigning genders to them. Obviously, in this show, like, it starts out with mother and father, and they each have sort of different functions within that weird family unit of the future that we're being shown. Yeah. Is there, like, in your opinion, a valid reason to give robots gender? Obviously, like, there's a whole sexual component potential that people might have thoughts about. And there's also a comfort level, right? Like, people respond to Sophia because she is this very cute young lady. But for you, what do you think are the merits and detractors there? So we actually did a study with robot forms and trust. You can look up the different robot forms that we looked at in the ABOT database. People assign more capability the more humanoid the robot is. But if you get to the point where you're trying to make it hyper-realistic you start to reach the uncanny valley where it it starts to freak people out. And Sophia is like that. Sophia is definitely in uncanny valley territory. Like some of the expressions it gives are just not the types of expressions you'd see on a human. So what we found is that people respond really well to humanoid androids that are almost anime cartoon characters, like the Now robot from SoftBank Robotics. And there's a level of functionality in terms of trust that you can get by making your robot humanoid. But going beyond that into this hyper-realistic area, it's still a little bit off-putting for me. I feel like the technology is maybe 10 years away from being where that won't be a problem. But to your original point, I don't think there's much use outside of the aforementioned uh, (laughs) sex spot situations to assign a gender to a robot. They're here, mother. Why didn't you tell me? I knew you'd try and stop me from transmitting our location. You were right, I will try and stop you, because that is the exact opposite of our core objective. Perhaps you were the one who needs a systems check, Father. Now, in this show, too, there are also divisions having nothing to do with gender, but having to do with sort of a a class system that's established among the androids. And at some points, they even seem a little sad when someone points out that they're less proficient than their others. (laughs) Could you see a world where that could emerge as a problem as we go forward, as a unit is outdated? Would they become conscious of their own lesser status when the new units come out? This brings up a fundamental question of, is it appropriate if a robot gets consciousness or become self-aware. Right. And this is something science fiction has struggled with for ages. I don't think we're ready to answer the question, but I do think that we should use human rights as a guidepost for trying to find out what the answers will be when the technology emerges. If you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are all sorts of things that you should not do to people. And we should probably assign a lot of those things that you don't do to people to robots as well. If not only to protect the robots, but also to protect the people who are engaging in those actions. Because what you don't want to do is to create a society that's become so desensitized in its interactions with androids that it starts committing human rights abuses right. against other humans. Okay, my final question for you is a little bit pie in the sky, but come with me. Okay. I want to know what your 
sort of dream is for the future of robotics and AI. When you think about, like, whether that's within your lifetime or beyond it, I'm sure you have considered the possibilities of where these things could go. You've talked about them. And I'm wondering what your sort of ideal future is in terms of us living potentially with androids. So my ideal future is one in which people are not struggling every day just to survive and that basic needs of people can be met through automation. We have been through several industrial revolutions so far. The first industrial revolution was about textile mills, steam power, locomotive. Second industrial revolution, you had electricity. Third industrial revolution, silicon and computers. Fourth industrial revolution is the early robotics revolution. We've been through these changes where automation has created a greater standard of living for a large number of people. And I know that there are billions of people right now who haven't benefited from that. Okay, so about half the world's population lives on less than $2.50 a day. 3.7 billion, I believe. Yeah. So those people are not currently benefiting from all of the improvements that automation and electricity and all these other industrial revolutions have had. My hope is that with robotics and AI, we can see everybody benefit. And we can see a world where things like working all day long in a factory become an antiquated practice. Humans don't have to do that anymore. Humans can focus on self-actualization and figuring out what the next great scientific advance is, what the next great social advance is. I just believe that this technology can do profound things to liberate people from just painful, backbreaking work. And my hope is that we enter a world where that can be done with equity. And then we will all go to space together. <laughs> and then we'll all go to space together. Or we'll send frozen embryos to space. There you go. That wraps up this episode, which, as it turns out, has revealed that in real life, we might not be as close to getting human-like androids with the ability to morally reason as raised by wolves might excite us to believe. And again, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Anyway, I am sure that as the show unfolds, you are going to have many, many more questions about the scientific and technological concepts it explores. I know I will. So I will be here getting the scoop from the experts each week. I want to thank Aaron Guzikowski for stopping by and for creating this awesome series. And I want to thank Peter Haas for spending time with me and sharing some of his seemingly endless knowledge of robotics and AI. Raised by Wolves, the podcast is a production of HBO Max and iHeartRadio, hosted by me, Holly Fry. The podcast is produced by Ethan Fixell, written and researched by Chris Crovaton, and engineered, edited, and mixed by James Foster. If you haven't already subscribed, rated, or reviewed Raised by Wolves, the podcast, please do so on the iHeartRadio app, HBO Max, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to watch the series itself on HBO Max with new episodes available to stream on Thursdays. 